the death of Valador. Thought for the day. The only thing better than slaying your enemies is to watch them slay each other. Dear colleagues, the following recounts the conflict between craft world Eandon and the Tyranids of Highfleet Kraken. Although you will have a natural, spiritual disgust at the knowledge contained within this, it is important to remember that it is your duty to slay and destroy the enemies of mankind, and as servants of the throne, you have been selected to be given this disgusting knowledge of these Xenos races, so that you may annihilate them, and so bring the galaxy into the hands of mankind. Ave Imperator, the Emperor protects. To begin, since the brutal intrusion of the Hive Fleets across the Eastern Fringe, even the proudest Eldar mind has quelled at the Tyranid threat. So great is the menace of the invaders from beyond the void that the prophets of the Eldar race cried tears of blood at their coming. Didn't see that coming, though, did they? The Autarchs and Farseers of the craft worlds know well that the tactic of evasion is of little use against an enemy capable of assailing such great swathes of space. Waiting for the invaders to expend themselves is not a viable solution either. The Tau Empire is but a single shield against a tide, and to the incredulity of the Elder, the Imperium of Man is making matters worse by feeding the ravenous high fleets entire generations of warriors in a ham-fisted attempt to stop their advance, according to them. The seers and scholars of the Eldar craft worlds had long suspected that the Tyranid race grew stronger with every world it conquered, primarily due to the gargantuan bioships at the hearts of each high fleet. These monstrosities render down the harvested matter of their victims, combining it with the liquefied corpses of those Tyranids killed in the attack and subsequently reclaimed. Each new race the Tyranids encounter is killed, consumed, boiled down to biological gruel, and used to create ever more deadly weapon beasts from the resultant raw materials. It was this accelerated evolution that the Eldar sought to stop in the Valador system, for should the high fleets continue on their rampage, the craft worlds of the future would be doomed. Unbeknownst to them, the resultant war would force them to destroy the world of Doriel altogether. The rapid evolutionary leaps made by the womb beasts known as Norn Queens ensure the Tyranid swarms adapt at shocking speed to overcome their prey's technological advances. With each piece of knowledge gained and with each grotesque adaption, the Hive Fleet increases the lethality of its warriors in preparation for the next wave of assaults. To the Elder, the Tyranids represent an aspect of their mythological dragon concept, mindless destruction made manifest and set loose upon the stars. The Eldar know in their hearts that they must take up the challenge and fight the monster laying waste to their ancient domains, for only they have the wisdom enough to defeat it, apparently. Yet they fear to do so, of course, for their numbers are few, yes, and the Tyranids are unfortunately many. Functionally infinite, in fact, if the Farseers are to be believed. One such visionary was Teak Silverai of Eandon, a gifted but eccentric seer whose prophecies of invasion were proved unerringly accurate during the fall of Eandon. Perhaps had his peers listened to him, they would have avoided disaster. Perhaps the craft world's near demise was inevitable. Either way, the tragic fate of Eandon had become well known for at the ruins of the Eldar civilization, a cautionary tale against underestimating the Tyranid race. A single tendril of High Fleet Kraken had detected, hunted down, and slaughtered the greater part of Craftworld Iandon's populace before being repelled at great cost. In the process, the once vibrant world ship was reduced to skeletal ruin, and its people were forced to wake their dead and plunge them back into the fires of war. So that the living could hope to survive. A Tyranid Eye Fleet is of an unimaginable scale. Escaping its grasp is no easy feat. This proved truest of High Fleet Kraken, the most insidious of their kind. Unlike the sledgehammer assault of High Fleet Behemoth, 
The Kraken attacked in a series of questing, spacefaring tendrils, each comprised of hundreds of bioships that probed the defences of the High Fleet's foes before driving home its attack against their weakest point. Just as all seemed lost for the beleaguered craft world of Ayandan, the tendril constricting it had been defeated by the return of Prince Yerl's Corsair fleet. The Pyrrhic victory of the Elder, in conjunction with the actions of the Imperial forces upon Ica VI, uh, shattered the main tendrils of High Fleet Kraken and reduced the bulk of the High Fleet to little more than a painful memory. However, the smaller tendrils that yet floated in the void were still enough to deal the death blow, should they bring Eandon to battle once more. In the process of extricating themselves from the devastation of the Eastern Fringe, the seers of Eandon harnessed the psychic backlash of their craft world's near extinction. In a long and dangerous meditation ritual, they magnified these negative energies until they resonated through Eandon's infinity circuit, the psychic matrix that forms the skeleton, if you will, of each titanic worldship. All the death and terror of the craft world was focused uh, to a singular point in time and space. The emotional energy pouring out of the mourning craft world was so intense that it collapsed the veil between real space and the immaterium, boring a hole in reality and leaving a temporary warp storm in the craft world's wake. Several of the smaller tendrils questing towards the escaping worldship recoiled from the gnawing lesion it left behind, fleeing in disarray from the hellish portal. The tendril of High Fleet Kraken that was nearest to Ayandan, however, was not fast enough to escape. Driving like a living thing, it was drawn into the sea of unreality beyond the vortex. The grieving Eldar cared little about what became of the splinter fleet they had banished into the warp. Immediate survival was their first and only priority, as is ever the way with the Eldar. For many, it was felt that sending the remainder of the High Fleet into a demon-infested hell realm had a macabre elegance. Though the act of opening such a large and potentially permanent wound in reality was strictly forbidden, the tactic had made Eandon's escape a certainty. It was an act that would come back to haunt them. The tides of the warp are fickle, and the gods that dwell within the Immaterium revel in cruelty. The awful scale of the High Fleet's threats had been made clear. The coming of the Tyranids would almost certainly see the galaxy torn open and the Eldar race dwindle even further towards extinction. A fate that could not be born, for the Eldar anyway. Several years after the events that had brought Craftworld Iandan to its knees, the seer Teak Silverai predicted a far-off war whose ultimate consequences would finish Iandan once and for all. His prophetic abilities had been proven beyond all doubt during the invasion of Eandon, and so the Farseer's cryptic words were relayed with all haste to the High Council of the Craftworld. Led by the beautiful spirit seer Ayana Arianal, the seers of Eandon cast their runes and sent their minds along the skeins of fate. Together, the seers had the strength to penetrate the lingering psychic shadow cast by the Tyranids to investigate Silverai's prophecy firsthand. What they saw in the skeins of fate drove them to the edge of panic. The Tyranid High Fleet that had caught Eandon in its grasp still bore the psychic spore of the Eldar mines it had tasted during the Battle of Eandon. Its creatures carried a faint but traceable stain of angst, a thin patina of soul stuff that only the most gifted Eldar psychers in the galaxy could detect. The spirit seers of Eandon excelled above all others in matters beyond the veil, and their farseer colleagues guided their journey across the void with expert precision. In this way, the High Fleet's passage could be followed across the trackless wastes of deep space. As the hunting ritual reached completion, each of the spirit seers cried out in shock. The splinter fleet that had been swallowed by the warp storm had not been destroyed as they had hoped, nor trapped amongst the immaterial doldrums, but instead vomited out of the legion in real space known as the Vortex of Despair. It was heading towards a world already infested by Tyranids, those of High Fleet Leviathan. The newest of the High Fleets to penetrate the galaxy, Leviathan had glutted itself on biomass from hundreds of Imperial worlds before plunging into the Orc Empire of Octarius. 
Uh, the Imperium of Man had brought itself time by evacuating or destroying those worlds in Leviathan's path, and diverted the High Fleet into the Orcoid space. But, in the process, it had exceeded its inability to halt the High Fleet's inexorable advance. The Eldar would shoulder this burden alone. The assimilation of two major High Fleets could be disastrous, for the Tyranid's evolutionary process would run riot, producing ever deadlier strains of warrior constructs with the biological bounty they had reaped. Should the armies of Kraken and Leviathan be reclaimed by the same bioships, those Tyranids that had tasted the genius of Eandon and those grown strong on the tough genetic stock of Orcs would combine into a new breed of super predator. Within the veiny wombs of the broodships, an array of uh, physically mighty and fiercely intelligent beasts would be born, an unstoppably potent strain of Tyranids that would spread across the stars to overwhelm the resistance of Eldar, Man, and Orc alike. Deep in the Galactic South, the world of Doriel glowed golden in the firmament, a luminous world of tropical heat and balmy seasons. It orbited at the ideal distance from its sun for sentient colonization. The planet had always had a favoured existence under the auspices of the Eldar, and not merely through chance, for that ancient race had long ago planetscaped the whole world to their whims. Iana Arianel believed that Silver Eye's prophecy pointed to Doriel's recent conquest by the Tyranid Voidspawn. The planet's name meant lambent fire in the Eldar tongue, and the spirits here claimed that the prophecy's references to a dying flame meant that lambent fire was about to be snuffed out. The Seer Council was assembled and the runes of seeing were cast. As the Eldar scryed the paths of the future, they were appalled by Darial's fate. Since its days as a radiant gemstone in the crown of the Eldar Empire, the runes implied that the once glorious world had not only been conquered by mankind, but also brought to the brink of ruin by the Tyranids. Ten thousand years ago, the planet of Doriel had been scoured clean of Eldar by the psychic shockwave of their empire's self-destruction. All that was left were the cadavers of those whose souls had been taken by Slanesh, soulless husks which eventually rotted and crumbled to dust. However, the works of the Eldar are built to endure the passage of time. When the crude warships of the Imperium's settler fleets made planet for, the Eldar's architecture, art, and landworks endured. The Imperium slowly settled the abandoned world with its own people, and set about the systematic destruction of every single thing the Eldar had made. After a decade of hard labour and controlled demolitions, the lands of the world were carpeted by ivory-hued dust, punctuated by fist-sized chunks of psychoplastic and spars of wraithbone. The Imperium rebuilt Doriel with grinding predictability, covering the once golden meadows with thick black ferrocrete and erecting cathedrals and hab blocks in which the constant influx of settlers could live and worship their emperor, our emperor. Over the years, Duriel was changed completely. Millennia of abuse saw the planet's forests wither away to twisted, petrified stumps. Its warm oceans dried up entirely, as the populace coaxed more and more geothermic power from the planet's core. War, disease, and strife raged back and forth across the planet as the Imperium beat its destiny into the world. Yet the yoke of mankind was a kind fate in comparison to the coming of the Tyranids. The warrior swarms of Leviathan overcame the Imperial defences in a series of bloody victories that took less than a week. Then, the feeding process began in earnest. But, Still, the planet's woes were not over. Even as Leviathan rained billions of ferocious feeder organisms onto the planet's surface, the splinter fleet of High Fleet Kraken drifted towards Doriel to join the feast. The runic divinations of Eandon's Farseers implied that the splinter fleet had been cast out of its strange odyssey in the warp, had deliberately ejected if the runes spoke true, and had poured forth from the vortex of despair to head straight for Doriel. Even if Iandon's armies risked the shattered tunnels of the webway in mass, the chances of them making planetfall in time to stop the Tyranid High Fleets merging were dangerously small. Only Craftworld Beartan 
uh, gliding through the galactic surf on its own unfinished business, had any hope of reaching the war zone before the high fleets mingled. Wasting no time, the seer council of Eandon sent a psychic plea for the intervention of their cousins on Beltan. Concerned that this was not their fight to win, Beltan's war council were divided as to whether they should unleash the sword wind, until Ayana Arianel sent them a message consisting of a single word she knew would resonate within their warrior hearts. Extermination. Within the space of a few hours, Craftworld Beltan was drifting purposely towards Dariao, to make their final approach directly through real space, and hence stray into the path of the converging high fleets would be pure folly. Beltan would likely suffer the same fate as Eandon. Instead, the Sword Wind's war hosts made careful use of the webway's widest passageways to complete the journey to the Tyranid-infested planet. A steady stream of sleek grav tanks and swooping flyer squadrons flashed out of the ancient webway portals that glittered atop Doriel's highest mountains. The Tyranids in the valleys below were entirely unaware of the skimmers taking position in the spore-choked clouds above. The component parts of the Swordwind carefully maintained arrowhead formations. At the heart of each cloud bank, the elite wings of Crimson Hunters swooped past the Falcons and Wave Serpents as they took up prearranged positions. Before the sun had set, an invisible army of Eldar had gathered in the skies. By the next morning, they had spread out across the planet, and located the Tyranids of the Kraken Swarms that were to be their prey, and reconvened above them all without leaving the cover of the clouds. And by the time the sun rose, the Eldar were in position to strike from a muster point high above the mountain known as God Peak. Beneath them, a crimson sea of Tyranid chitin stretched across the valley and beyond. A great swathe of Tyranids from the Kraken Splinter Fleet swept across the plains, bounding towards the distant swarms of High Fleet Leviathan with the intent of harvesting as much biomass as possible, rival Tyranids included. The Eater Beasts of Leviathan were oblivious to the approach of Kraken's armies. They were preoccupied with devouring the biomass of Doriel's twisted forests, and, once their gullets were full, hauling themselves into the steaming pools of acid that dotted the planet's ravaged landscape. Though they knew it not, the swarms were about to combine. Should the Tyranids of the Kraken Splinter Fleet join the feast, and should their biomass be merged together in the acidic digestion pools, all the bioships would have to do to reap the bounty of both was absorb the bubbling acidic gruel from the capillary towers sprouting from each pool. There was no time to waste. In order to keep the two Tyranid swarms separate, the armies of the Eldar had to strike as hard and as fast as they could. Out of the skies came the sword wind, waves of gravcraft bursting from the clouds as pulsars and scatter lasers spat bolts of white-hot death into the massed Tyranids below. The shuriken catapults and cannons of Beltan's guardian battle hosts raked great furrows across the vanguard of the splinter fleet swarm, clawing up tyranids and cracked earth alike. The fury of the sudden assault forced the tyranids to seek cover amongst the twisted vegetation. As the beasts milled in confusion, squads of brightly coloured aspect warriors debarked onto the plateaus that dotted the Valley of the Gods, assessing their prey before falling upon the Xenos below. Ortark, Eloek, Sunspear of Beltan had long studied the Tyranids, and he knew well that the swarm's cohesion could be broken by the destruction of a few choice targets. As Sunspear calmly relayed his commands, Dark Reapers strode to the cliff-like edges of the God Peak Massa. Their missile salvos detonated amongst the Tyranid warriors that were marshalling the swarm below, sending chitinous limbs and broken bone swords in all directions. Heavy weapons flickering, squadrons of war walkers picked off bulbous zone throat broods whose psychic shields overloaded under the relentless energy beams. Fire dragons leveled tight volleys of fusion gunfire at the bulky Torvagons, hunkering down in the rocks. The searing agony of each kill, sending out psychic shockwaves that saw termagant broods surrounding their progenitors drop writhing to the ground. Sunspear himself led an honor guard of exarchs against the snake-bodied terrors that were attempting to cut off their retreat. Through the orchestrated slaughter strode the Avatar of Cain, the boundless battle-lust of Beltan made real. 
Tyranid leader beasts died by the dozen at his hands, for his blood was fire and he carried death in his grasp. As the dusk turned to darkness, Autark Sunspear's plan came to fruition. Without the guidance of their synapse creatures, the Kraken swarms found themselves directionless and confused, milling around like a damned river swirling back on itself. The Tyranids of High Fleet Kraken had been kept separate from those of Leviathan, and the immediate danger averted for a time. The hive mind that controls the Tyranid race has a cold and deadly intelligence, and it cannot be denied for long. After the initial surprise of the invasion, the brood beasts of the Kraken Splinter Fleet had scurried into a hundred hiding places, scattering in all directions to evade the deadly hunters that had cut swathes through their ranks. The Eldar began the systematic destruction of those warrior beasts they could find. Striking scorpions spattered the scree with alien ichor, while swooping hawks and warp spiders flitted from boulder to spire, methodically slaughtering the lesser tyranids with las blaster volleys and monofilament webs. Yet the tyranids of High Fleet Kraken were not alone upon the dying world of Duriel. What had at first appeared to be storm clouds rising in the distance soon proved to be something far more deadly. Urgent reports from the Viper Outriders of the Warhost had detailed an airborne swarm of staggering proportions that was inbound upon the Warhost's position. The sleeping giant that was High Fleet Leviathan had been awoken. The horizon buzzed with activity as swarms beyond counting swept across the plains. Thousands of leather-winged gargoyles flocked towards the flat highlands from which the Aspect Warriors had launched their assault. And, though the Arrowhead attack runs of the Cloud Strike squadrons above sent a great many blazing to the plains below, they could not stop them all. The chitinous mass broke over the Eldar position like a living hurricane. Thin screams filled the air as the Eldar were quickly overwhelmed by the sheer number of foes. Squad after squad of Aspect Warriors broke and fell back to the waiting Gravcraft, hovering at the lip of each mesa. Their pursuers pressed the assault, ravening swarms of flesh-borer beetles filling the skies with vile chitinous bodies, as the Eldar reached the apparent safety of their wave serpent and falcon transports. Shimmering clouds of Tyranids' living ammunition boarded the transports along with them. The Grav tanks sped off into the night, unaware that in the act of sealing their hatches, they had also sealed the fate of those in their holds. Now little more than abattoirs filled with tyrannid eater beasts and Eldar bones. <laughs> On the plateaus below, the heavier elements of the Eldar war host were fighting for their lives against the throng of winged tyrannids that had descended upon them. Haradans the size of small spacecraft burst through the swarm on gigantic wings, snatching up agile war walkers and dashing the delicate Eldar machines to pieces against the sheer face of the god peak. Hive tyrants and harpies, borne on clawed pinions, screamed death into those winged Eldar brave enough to weather the spore clouds that choked the skies. Hive crones carved great gouges into the wraith bone of those Eldar titans that moved to intercept the swarm, whilst below them the Avatar's fierce red glow was hidden from sight by the volume of weapon beasts piling atop it. Autark Sunspear had no option but to send a command pulse of withdrawal to what remained of his war host. His worst fears had closed around him like talons around a throat. The entire planet was infested. The Swordwind's only real hope of achieving a swift victory had been to attack with overwhelming force, slaughter the splinter fleet, and escape before the swarms of Leviathan could bring their impossible might to bear. In this, the Eldar had failed. Though a great many of the crack and splinter fleet had been slaughtered, the deadly threat it represented remained at large. As ferocious as the sword wind was, the invading swarms were just too numerous to overcome without outside aid. The price of that aid would prove costly indeed. The far seers of Beltan, casting their runes in the craft world's dome of crystal seers, had long suspected that the sword wind's preemptive strike would not be enough to destroy the splinter fleet altogether. Then why did they send them? There were simply too many creatures. Though one swarm might be destroyed by the blades of the sword wind, all it would take was a rain of reinforcements from the bio ships, and the threat would begin anew. To attack the Tyranid forces conventionally 
It was as futile as trying to save a harvest from a locust swarm by killing individual insects. The farseers greeted the returning autarchs of the sword wind with grim expressions and bowed heads. There were no debates this time, no ritual observances or titles, simply a declaration that chilled all who heard it. Quaff world Eandon was inbound, but it was still too far away to help, and even should its war host successfully negotiate the webway, conventional measures would not be enough. Even scouring the planet clean with a firestorm, a ploy much beloved by the dull-witted human strategists of the Imperium, was not guaranteed to kill those tyrannids that could burrow under Doriel's surface and use its skin as a shield. As tragic as it was, the only certain way to prevent the Hive Fleet uniting was to physically destroy the planet from the inside out and in the process exterminate every living thing upon it. This act would have been of little challenge to the Eldar Empire of old, but for the Craftworlders, it was a different matter. The power of those glory days is remembered in legend and little else. Beltan could still depopulate a world over time, but it had long since lost the ability to destroy a planet. Pathetic. Amongst the Farseers meditating in the Dome of Crystal Seers, the runes of Eandon and Beltan were orbiting the runes of dying hope and imminent catastrophe. However, the runic symbol for Lilithanto Claver, loosely translated as the knife that stays the blade, was circling the rune for dawn. It was a jagged and unpleasant symbol long associated with the craft world as sinister cousins, the Dark Elder. Yet it implied that aid could be sought from the unholy cities of the Webway and still arrive in time to stop Joriel's fateful assimilation. Wartark Sunspear was the only member of the Biltan War Council to have visited Kamora and survived. He still recalled the pathway to that surreal and twisted realm, though many of its portals were metaphysical in nature and had likely shifted over the centuries. Summoning his peers once more, Sunspear told the War Council of Biltan that there was no way a delegation of the Swordwind could approach Kamora without being delayed or even hunted unto death. Even if they were successful in their journey, they might not return in time to stop the Tyranid bio-harvest, but the Dark Eldar were unlikely to reveal their secret paths through the webway to outsiders. Yet there was still a slender path into the future that held hope. Slowly and with great dignity, Sunspear made his way across Beltan to the great amphitheatre and took down a delicate mask of porcelain, half laughing, half weeping, from the apex of its archway. As soon as Sunspear had made his way, onto the crescent-shaped stage. The mask tumbled from the Autarch's fingers and shattered into a hundred shards on the platform below. To the War Council's growing fascination, each of the shards threw up a glittering pillar of light that coalesced into an Eldar warrior dancer. Sunspear knelt before the shimmering figures, relaying Yandan's dilemma and covering Biltan's recent battle in an archaic form of Eldar language unheard upon the craft world for centuries. Aid must be given, he said, and swiftly, lest the galaxy face a threat, magnified to unstoppable levels. The Harlequin Amigos said not a word, though the regal figure at the heart of their great troop bowed elaborately. In a flash of multicoloured diamonds, the warrior dancer images shattered apart and vanished back into the shards scattered before the kneeling autark. Sunspear rose back to his feet and stated flatly to the astonished onlookers, that the craft world would prepare for war once more. They were returning to Doriel, this time with not one, but two allied armies at their sides. What infernal bargain was struck on Beltan's behalf and the dark reaches of the webway remained shrouded. Yet Sunspear's ploy to use the Harlequins as ambassadors to the Dark City proved extremely effective. Within the space of a single day, the war fleet of Beltan taking a position around the webway portal to Doriel, was shadowed by the blade-like attack craft of the Dark Eldar. Contact had been made between the Craftworlders and their Comorite cousins, snide and caustic at first, but businesslike enough when the matter of Doriel's fate came to hand. As tense hours slid past, a rapport was established between Sunspear and the leader of the Dark Eldar warfleet, the wizened Lord Sarnak whose permanent grin was unsettling in the extreme. The Archon claimed to be working under the authority of Azdrabal Vect himself, a fact that was backed up by the many warships in his fleet. 
along with a key element of the cabal of the Black Heart. Sarnak had brought fully half of the infamous Witch Cults of Strife. It was a formidable boost to Biltan's chances of victory. Yet, the real prize of the Harlequin's bargain with the Camorites was far more exotic. Vect's Cabalites possessed the power which Beltan sought, a device that could utterly destroy a planet. This most potent of weapons took the form of a psychically activated doomsday engine, the Fireheart, it was called, a complex nodal resonator capable of causing a planet's molten core to enter violent death throes and send lakes of lava bubbling to the surface. Despite its potency, it was of little use to the Dark Elder, for they had outlawed the use of psyche-based weaponry long ago, on the grounds that it attracted the attention of their nemesis, Slanesh. Yet the Fireheart was of great value to the Craftworlders. With sadistic relish, Lord Sarnak informed the Eldar High Council that, unfortunately, the Fireheart device could not be used remotely. A ritual circle of seers would have to activate it planetside and remain there, to ensure the correct psychic rites were observed in order to fully destabilise Duriel's core. The Craftworlders had no choice but to comply. The Craftworld seers would have to ride out the planet's extermination as it unfolded around them, their unavoidable death the price of Duriel's certain destruction. Of course, there was no way they could complete the Fireheart's activation without a full-scale military invasion to buy them time. The Archon giggled maniacally as he leered close to the holographic device linking him to Sunspear and his kin, drinking in the dismay of his Craftworlder cousins as a torturer revels in the breaking of his prey. The price of Doriel's destruction would be great indeed, costing the lives of the Craftworld's greatest psychers. Still, the course of the future was set. The sword wind had been gathered and the fate of Doriel was set in motion. All that remained was to wage war or so the Autarchs fought. Down on the planet's surface, there was a twist in Doriel's fate that even the Farseers had not foreseen. Hidden in the Valley of the Gods, a webway portal, the most secret of gateways, had been breached. In their haste to retreat from Doriel and formulate a new attack strategy, the armies of Biltan had failed to properly seal the blazing portals to the webway that sat atop the highest of the planet's mountains. The Eldar Warhost, had fought with the fury of Cain to keep the swarms apart. The skies had been cleared above the valleys and poisonous ichor had spattered down like rain. In their pride, the Craftworld's armies believed that they had brought themselves enough time to regroup. To the dismay of the War Council, however, there remained a leader beast upon Doriel, powerful and prescient enough to direct the disparate kraken swarms towards the now defenceless mountaintop portals. After the Beltan Warhouse had withdrawn, the Tyranid swarms, driven by the psychic imperatives of the Swarm Lord, penetrated the shimmering gateway in the Valley of the Gods. They leapt and scuttled in their hundreds through the portal to the Labyrinth Dimension. Even the rapid intervention of the Witch Cult of Strife, its Raider Gravcraft, scrambling to reach the swarm in an attempt to halt the intrusion, was not enough to stem the tide of alien bodies. Despite the blades of the witches and the Vicious volleys of dark light and splinter fire levelled at the Tyranid Horde. The Dark Eldar Warhost could not hold them back indefinitely. A great cry of anguish rang out through the webway's tunnels as the Eldar realised that their sacred realm had been infested. Whilst Beltan's Farseers held a psychic council of war in preparation for a second strike, the armies of Craftworld Eandon were deployed deep in the reaches of the webway, making all haste for the front line in the Valador system. As they opened the last few portals between them and their destination, they were met head-on by a ravening swarm of Tyranids. The massed Eldar of Eandon immediately fell back in controlled retreat, unable to fight their way through the wall of crimson carapaced bodies flowing towards them. It was then that Tayak Silverai ordered the advance of the Ghost Warriors. Impervious to the claws and talons of Kraken's beasts, the statuesque constructs of Eandon's warhost formed a wall of wraithbone that plugged the tunnels one by one around the God's Peak webway gate. Roaring Carnifexes that had bullied their way into the webway's tunnels smashed the wraith guard apart before being destroyed in their turn by the wraith knights that stooped through the glowing tunnels. Yet it was the emergence of the Heroes of Eldar legend that saw the tide turn. 
led by Iandan's own avatar and bolstered by the High Council of Iandan, all six of the fabled Phoenix Lords vaulted and sprang from spar to shattered spar. Every slicing shuriken and pinpoint thrust took a tyrannid life. Morgan Ra mowed down scores of gaunts with his great battle scythe, the Morgata. Jane Zar dueled deftly with a pair of hive tyrants, and Bararaf blinded Carnifexes one after another, allowing Fugan to incinerate the beasts with his burning lance. Slowly, inevitably, the invading tyranids were pushed back. The grand war host of Eandon trampled their bodies to emerge triumphant onto Doriel's peaks. The final battle was just beginning. When the Eldar of Beltan returned to Doriel, a pang of pure sorrow fled in their hearts. The planet bore as much resemblance to its former beauty as a flayed skull did to the face of a lovely maiden. It had been systematically stripped bare of all life. All life, that is, save for the tyrannid invaders themselves. Bubbling, tactile fringed digestion pools scarred the surface like open sores. The massed spore beasts belched alien foulness into the air. Eater swarms from both high fleets roamed the valleys, seizing the last scraps of biomass from the planet's crust before plunging bodily into the digestion pools. Left to their own devices, the larger war beasts of the high fleets fought amongst themselves, slaves to their baser instincts now that Doriel's conquest was complete. In the middle distance, a thin forest of swaying mouth parts quested for earth bound capillary towers, their ribbed lengths vanishing into the heavens. From afar, they looked like the tentacles of some celestial sea monster hunting for prey. Autark Sunspear knew that the bio-ship tendrils were beyond his reach. Each mouth part was wide enough to accommodate a grav tank in its serpentine gullet, and the swarms that surrounded them would fight like crazed beasts in their defence. The Eldar had hours at best to stop the red-tinged digestion pools that dotted the valleys from being drained by the probing tendrils high above. The absorption process had begun. As Autark Sunspear surveyed the dismal landscape of what had once been Doriel. The disembodied voices of his roaming Viper pilots whispered in his ear. A highly unusual point of conflict had been located several leagues to the north. The Outriders had found a trail of tyrannid corpses that led to a seething mound of purple chitin. The Viper pilots requested Sun Spear's advice on how to proceed. Wasting no time, the Autark requisitioned a nearby falcon and took to the spore-choked skies. As Sun Spear's sleek grav tank led a formation of Eldar skimmers over the hellish landscape, he dimly perceived a burning red glow at the heart of the mound of tyrannid dead to the north. Sun Spear gave a shout of elation. He could clearly make out the raging avatar of Beltan amongst the horde, oozing molten metal from a dozen wounds but still fighting with the fury of Cain himself. The mighty Soan Dayala, known as the Wailing Doom, burst from the chest of a rearing Morlock, even as his bloody hand crushed the head of a tyrannid warrior with a wet pop. Here was the supremacy of the Eldar writ large. Here was where they would make their stand. At Sun Spear's command, the armies of Beltan hurtled down from God Peak towards the avatar of their warrior god. Debarking atop the mound of alien corpses, the great host of Aspect Warriors raised their voices in a fierce war shout and prepared to buy their seers the time they needed to activate the Fireheart. The far seers, hurrying from the cavernous holds of the Niad class cruiser Vol's Caress, bade their escort carry the Fireheart to the thinnest part of Doriel's crust. Scant minutes later, the nodal core of the ancient device began to pulse a deep red. Subsonics thrummed through the parched earth under their feet. The seers were not the only warriors to emerge from the Caress, unfolding themselves from the largest cargo bays were giants born only for war. A phantom titan reared up to its full height, its noble head reaching the spore clouds as its ancestral colours shimmered under protective hollow fields. At its flanks strode a pair of revenant titans, twin engines of destruction. The trio of war machines moved with a fluidity that belied their size, striding into formation with the practised ease of the aspect warriors below. Zooming past the shoulders of the magnificent titans came bladed Dark Eldar Gravcraft and flocks of murderous scourges. 
appearing to the craft world as much like black-winged vultures whirling in search of their next meal. In their wake came a host of brightly patterned venoms, their fluttering pennants proclaiming the glory of the laughing god. Atop the god peak, the webway portal burned bright as unit after unit of Eldar took up formation, weapons ready and eyes blazing with the need for vengeance. No matter the cost, the Firehearts would be activated and Doriel would suffer a fiery and violent end. The precision and speed of the Eldar attack was a military work of art. It took several minutes before the alien hordes became truly aware of the scale of the threat assailing them. Yet, as knowledge of the Eldar's presence flowed through the synapse creatures of the swarm, the Sea of Tyranids recoiled and bunched up, readying for an assault of unprecedented size. With the fury of a predator that had been cheated of its prey, the swarm screeched as one and plunged towards the Eldar massing in the God Peak Valley. High Fleet Leviathan's attack was terrifying in its intensity. Lumbering packs of Carnifexes bulldozed their way across the corpse fields, charging headlong into a storm of shuriken catapult fire to crash straight through the Aspect Warriors that moved to stop them, and then into the ranks of the Eldar Guardians behind. In their wake came massive Tyranifex gun beasts, their symbiotic weapons hurling vile salvos into the air as the Dark Eldar carved through the skies above. Harlequins wove a deadly dance with a horde of gene stealers that lapped around the Eldar flank, the ground below the combatants saturated with blood. To the south, a trio of hive tyrants marched with deadly intent towards the Eldar warhost, the living shields of their escorts protecting them from the worst punishment meted out by close knit shining spear squadrons that zoomed as fast as the eye could follow. On the slopes, gladiatorial teams of witches eviscerated squat bodied brood beasts, and succubi matched their peerless agility against the sheer ferocity of the serpentine ravenous that burst from the ground under their feet. To the east, the ground trembled as a gigantic hierophant stalked from the forest of capillary towers, stabbing its way towards the Eldar army's position with menace in every step. The phantom titan that had debarked from the caress and its ravenant escort leapt from the rear echelons to engage the beast with pulsar and sonic lance, each shot boring a hole straight through the monstrosity. In answer, the bio-titan roared and fired a volley of burning biological gunk, coating one of the revenants from head to foot and boiling away its systems until it toppled back into the dirt. The battle raged on, a stalemate at first, though the corpse count rose high on both sides. As yet more tyranids joined the fray, the odds were stacked further against the sword wind and its allies. To sun spears mounting on ease, broods from both Leviathan and Kraken were boiling out at the foothills of the God Peak and falling upon the Guardian warhost that sought to protect the Farseer Council as they awakened the Fireheart device. The attack was as sudden as it was unexpected, for the devious tendrils of Kraken's splinter fleet had waited for a gap to emerge in the Eldar battle line and then darted forth with all the fury they could muster. There was simply no time to reinforce the Guardian host. Every one of the Eldar and their allies were fighting at close quarters against tyranids of every conceivable kind. The situation was dire, indeed. But if the Fireheart was disrupted, then all would be for naught. Though the Guardian warhost was holding back the vanguard of the swarm with focused shuriken fire, it had little hope of stopping the leader beast that coordinated the assault. The giant hive tyrant stormed headlong into the Eldar ranks its four glimmering bone swords, carving apart any brave enough to bar its path. Nerves aflame, the fire seers beneath its gaze began to falter in their psychic activation ritual. Only the strident voice of Tiak Silvereye kept their focus intact, just as the hive tyrant loomed too close to stop, swirling holes in the fabric of reality, open like irises within its body, rippling the creature apart in explosions of ichor. The ghost warriors of Iandan stalked from the God Peak webway portal towards the beleaguered Swordwind. Their wraith cannons were ripping apart the largest tyranids, whilst the distortion scythes of speeding hemlock wraith fighters snuffed out the lesser gun beasts by the score. Wraith lords strode confidently into the tyranid warriors that were coordinating the assault on the valley, slashing their ghost glaives left and right. The elegant wraith knights in their wake sniped the remaining synapse creatures with controlled blasts from sun cannons and heavy wraith cannons. Screeching gargoyles flapped and clawed at the ghost constructs, but to no avail. 
Their statuesque physiques were so indomitable and their senses so far removed from the mortal plane that the Tyranids proved little more hindrance than a cloud of moths to a hunter. The arrival of Eandon's warhost had brought the Farseers time to complete a Fireheart's activation. As the psychically charged nodes of the device glowed a fierce red, the surface of the planet trembled and began to split open. Superheated steam vented from a thousand fissures as columns of lava soared skyward, and Dorial screamed in protest. The battle in the valley, already on the brink of madness, boiled over into pure mayhem as the ground shattered into shifting, cracking plates. Massed broods of tyranids were tipped into the red-hot molten rock that rose unstoppably from below. The hisses of their demise sounded like rain on a hot steel plate as the fires of Doriel consumed them whole. The air had filled with smoke and screams, yet instead of panic withdrawal, the tyranid broods redoubled their assault. Those Eldar still planetside were forced to fight with every ounce of fury they could muster invoking Cain to give them strength and springing across the gaps that opened wide in the planet's crust. Not all were successful. Whole chunks of the surface were breaking up and dissolving in the rising lava that gushed from each new wound, pitching aspect warriors and tyranids alike into the cleansing fires. The god peak itself shook mightily before its cap burst open in a titanic, triple pillar of white-hot lava, an immense pyroclastic cloud billowing out in all directions to consume the warriors on its flanks. The craft welders, dark Eldar allies, hurtled through the skies as the Fireheart device worked its ancient magics below, pausing in their escape only to subdue the larger tyranid beasts in a storm of blades and herd their recumbent forms into the runic hex cages that hung from their raider transports. Cries of despair floated up from the lava as hundreds of embattled Eldar were dissolved in the planet's lifeblood a macabre mockery of the Tyranid digestion cycle that had been broken open by this forced catastrophe. All around was confusion and terror. Even the bioships in orbit above seemed to know that destruction was at hand, for the ribbed capillary tubes were writhing fast, sucking up their gruesome harvest with desperate vigour. Autark Sunspear cried out in dismay as he watched High Fleet Leviathan's probing tubes latch on to the digestion pools filled with high-fleet Kraken's ruddy biomass. The capillary towers began to funnel the acidic gruel to the bioships with great parastaltic pulses. The Eldar had failed at the last hurdle. The tentacled monstrosities of the high fleets needed only a small sample of the mingled biomass to birth a new race of supernaturally advanced bioconstructs. Despite the Eldar's best efforts to stop them, the Tyranids had snatched their prize from the fires of defeat. Just as Sunspear's heart felt like it was about to turn to cold stone, the roaring thunderclap of supersonic aircraft boomed overhead. The Autark could just make out the jagged, sickle-winged shape of razor-wing fighter squadrons hurtling through the skies overhead, the edges of their wings limbed with the flicker of monomolecular fields. His eyes widened as the razor wings darted at incredible speed through the storms of magma and shot towards the capillary towers, that were draining the planet dry. Rather than avoiding the great muscled tubes, the jet fighters used their aircraft to carve through the capillary towers one by one, placing their wing blades with such expert precision that the liquid feast being sucked into the bioships spurted out like blood from severed arteries. The variegated tubes of the capillary towers toppled downwards, their precious liquid cargo gushing in all directions from the severed stumps, Sunspear laughed with disbelief and astonishment. The bioships of High Fleet Leviathan had been cheated of their ugly feast after all, and with Doriel falling apart beneath them, they had no hope of reclaiming it. His mission complete, Autark Sunspear withdrew his forces as best he could, as the thorn-patterned gravcraft of the Swordwind hurtled skyward towards Vol's caress. News of the wider battle reached him. Craft World Iandon's contribution to the battle for Doriel had not been confined to the battle planet side. Prince Yeril, the Grand Admiral of Iandon's fleet, had coordinated his twin armada of spacecraft on a seemingly suicidal attack run against the splinter fleet of High Fleet Kraken. After his victories at Iandon, he knew well how to slay the Tyranid monstrosities and instructed his commanders accordingly. Though it cost him the better part of his fleet, Yeril's eldritch raiders 
and the Eandon Armada ensured the destruction of each and every one of Kraken's bioships before escaping as Leviathan began to close in. In their death throes, the Splinter Fleet's bioships expelled yet more organisms towards Doriel's surface, but their deadly cargoes died in a sea of lava as soon as they reached the shattered crust. The Splinter Fleet had been slain. The doomed planet of Doriel had been led to ruin by the Imperium and brought to the edge of destruction by the High Fleets that followed it. Yet, it had been the Sons of Cain who had pushed it over the edge. The last of the Eldar left upon the ill-fated world were the Fireseers of Beltan, still channeling their psychic power into the Fireheart, whilst the air itself ignited, incinerating everything upon its surface. As the Eldar fleet fled into the safety of anonymous space, they left behind them a burning world, akin to a miniature sun, a lambent flame, fanned briefly into a raging inferno, before being extinguished forever. Meditating in his chambers, on the Vol's caress, Autark Sunspear prayed to the Eldar gods of old that Doriel's fate was not a metaphor for that of the entire Eldar race. No one answered. Deep in the bowels of Komora, the succubus Lilith Hesperex presented her newest prize to the homunculi of the Ebon Sting coven. Her witches brought forth six great hex cages full of spitting, hissing, tyrannid warrior organisms three sets with crimson carapaces, and the other three armoured in the deep purple of a livid bruise. After lengthy examinations, the homunculi assured her that the beasts could indeed be fused into a single strain, and that the coven's breeding vats were up to the task. The resultant menagerie of weapon beasts would be the talk of Kimura's gladiatorial arenas for some time to come. The regally dressed harlequin at Hesperex's side chuckled quietly, blowing a theatrical kiss towards the succubus before bowing deeply and vanishing into the shadows. Preparations had to be made, after all. The great game never stopped for long. Well, there we have it, a little Xenos on Xenos action for you there. I hope you did enjoy that. Makes a change not to have to mention lasguns and bolterguns in a video, I tell you. But, uh, yeah, good, good, uh, good tale. It's interesting, though, because, like, this is pre the Gathering Storm. This is pre the sort of return of Gilliman and the Indomitus Crusade and all that. So, like, if you don't know, obviously, Yandan then gets, basically, all of the soul stones get eaten in Yandan. Spoiler. <laughs> in order to the last to, to give the last push, the, birth, the last birth push of uh, the Eldar God of the Dead into, uh, into the universe. I don't know what's going on with that. I think I heard, like, Gav Thorpe wrote two books and Black Library doesn't want to continue with them anymore because no one's reading them, apparently. So I don't know what's going on there. Hopefully something gets done in the lore. I think that's probably the best place to approach it. But, yeah. Thank you all for watching. More stuff is coming. I've got, okay, I'm not going to, I'm going to tease you, but not too much. I've got a, three really good videos coming up, and I think you're really going to enjoy them. One of them is probably only going to be about an hour long, but it's, it's research intensive, all right? So I've got to pull off, pull off, I've got to pull from <laughs> several different, a lot of different sources, in fact, in order to make this work. Um, I've been working on it for a while. I want to get it out of the way because it's been a burden on me. I've, I've meant to do it for probably about three years now, to be honest. Anyway, that's coming. And also another one, which is also quite big, but I should be able to do it relatively quickly. Uh, it's like, it's going to probably be about four or five hours long. And another one, which is probably going to be about 10 hours long. And I could split it. These two big ones, I could split them up into separate things, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to release them as one big, awesome video for you to enjoy and hopefully you do those things are coming up but because the big ones take longer to make obviously i might have a gap of like a week or two because i'm just going to be working on that one video you get me but it'll be worth it i'll have some other things in between though um as we i mean i'm looking at probably march before these big ones are finished realistically i've got some novel reviews coming up i know that everybody's cup of tea but i enjoy doing them and i've been doing them since i started the channel so i'm going to carry on doing them i don't care what you think if you enjoy them thank you, you, you you're you're a true supporter of the channel because you watch those book reviews <laughs> but um those are coming up also probably some little story time stuff probably some other little videos there's a couple of things happening in 40k at the minute i might do some videos on them just talking about them you know just chatting like a little chat ranty thing i might do some of them but that's all i've got planned for the foreseeable future until we get to march april that's what's coming along uh, i've read about three novels i probably only really want to talk about two of them to be honest but uh, the other one there's not really much to say it wasn't that good yeah we'll see how things go Thank you for supporting the channel. Thanks to everybody supporting the channel 
all the way through and recently joined. I appreciate that. If you'd like to support the channel, please become a YouTube member, a, a supporter on Patreon or on Subscribestar. The links are below. I really appreciate that. And you will get your name added to this list of glorious heroes right here. And I really, really appreciate it, lads. Um, massive difference it makes to, to, to me being able to do all this fantastic. But if you can't, uh, please do, you know, I understand. I, understand. I don't take it personal. Don't worry about it. I don't take it personal. It's fine. But if you can't, please do at least like the video. Make sure you subscribe so you see new stuff and hit the bell and all that. And do let me know in the comments what you think of the videos. I appreciate that. I don't get to respond to everybody because there's a lot of comments. And I'm behind on them. But I'll have, a, I'll have a day when I'll just go through comments for like a couple of hours and just try and catch up. Thank you all again. Really appreciate it. And if you do do those things, liking and subscribing and uh, commenting on the videos, that really helps me as a small channel on um, YouTube do well, basically. It makes a big difference with how YouTube works in the background. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I'll be back again very, very soon with more stuff. Like I say, lots of good Imperium smashing people videos, quite intense videos coming up and some... But yeah, I think you'll enjoy the things that are coming up. I've, I've been thinking about them for a while. I think, that, uh, yeah, they're going to be good. They're going to be good. Don't worry. I'll be back again soon. Thanks again. See you later. Ta-ra. Have a good one. Bye-bye.